Dead America, Gun Runners Part 6, by Derek Slayton. Chapter 1, Day Zero Plus 53. Sergeant Alvarez pushed the gas pedal down as far as it would go, the engine roaring in response as the truck surged forward. Private Acosta's eyes remained fixed on the rearview mirror, scanning for any signs of pursuit from the militia trucks that were undoubtedly on their trail. The road stretched out before them, dark and desolate under the moon's pale glow. In the vast expanse of rural Washington, there was little to distinguish the landscape until they reached the next town, still some distance away. Anything yet Acosta, Alvarez's voice cut through the tension, his eyes focused intently on the road ahead. I don't see anything, Sarge. Acosta replied, her tone tinged with apprehension. Keep your eyes peeled. It's only a matter of time before they're on us, Alvarez cautioned, his grip tightening on the steering wheel. Fear and concern etched lines on their faces as they drove on in silence, the weight of their predicament heavy in the air. I hope the boys are okay. Acosta voiced her worry, her gaze still fixed on the receding horizon. They're tough bastards. They'll be all right, Alvarez reassured, though the uncertainty lingered in his own mind. How did it come to this, Sarge? Where the hell did they get all this manpower? Acosta's frustration seeped into her words. When we retreated, we left a power vacuum, and they stepped right up to fill it. I hate that we're in this position, but I can't blame them. Alvarez explained. They've spent the last couple of days shooting at us. I can certainly blame them. Acosta retorted bitterly, her grip tightening on her weapon. Alvarez chuckled softly, acknowledging the truth in her words, but opting for silence as they focused on the road ahead. As the miles stretched on, Acosta's vigilance paid off. Got something, she announced, her voice tense with urgency. What do you see? Alvarez's grip tightened on the wheel, his eyes flicking to the side mirror. One set of headlights, gaining on us quick. Acosta reported, her pulse quickening with adrenaline. Only one set of headlights. Alvarez's brow furrowed in confusion. Looks like Cillian got their attention, Acosta remarked. He just better have done it safely. Alvarez muttered under his breath. Acosta readied her rifle, her movement swift and precise as she prepared for the impending confrontation. She double-checked the spare magazines on her vest, ensuring they were fully loaded and within easy reach. Alvarez glanced in the mirror, noting the persistent distance maintained by their pursuers. What the hell are they doing? He muttered, his mind racing with possibilities. Maybe they got the memo that we have tail gunners. Acosta suggested, a note of uncertainty creeping into her voice. Even so, they're being way more hands-off than normal, Alvarez observed. Slowing the truck abruptly, Alvarez glanced over at Acosta with a determined expression. Testing a theory, he declared, his voice resolute. The tense standoff continued, both soldiers watching intently as the pursuing truck matched their reduced speed. What do they know that we don't? Acosta wondered aloud. I wish I knew, Alvarez admitted. Suddenly, the pursuing truck accelerated, hurtling towards them with alarming speed. Start shooting Acosta. Alvarez's command snapped Acosta into action, her training kicking in as she drew her handgun and extended it out the window. Despite her best efforts, the darkness and the erratic movements of their pursuers made it difficult for Acosta to land a clean shot. Alvarez swerved the truck back and forth, attempting to throw off their attackers, but to no avail. Bullets pinged off the back of the truck, forcing Alvarez to take drastic action. Slamming on the brakes, he braced for impact as the enemy vehicle closed in. As the truck veered alongside them, Acosta unleashed a barrage of gunfire, her shots finding their mark as several bullets pierced the enemy's vehicle. The impact sent the truck careening off the road, a cloud of dust and debris erupting in its wake. Alvarez seized the opportunity to put some distance between them, his eyes scanning the road ahead for any sign of danger. Try hitting those assholes with the rifle. That handgun isn't packing enough punch, he instructed, his voice tight with urgency. Acosta nodded, her hand steady as she readied her rifle for the next encounter. With renewed determination, they pressed on down the highway, the distant lights of Colfax looming on the horizon. As they approached the edge of town, Alvarez brought the truck to a halt, his eyes scanning the scene unfolding behind them. Doesn't look like they're all that interested in coming after us. He observed, his voice tinged with suspicion. The question is, why? Acosta replied, her gaze flicking between the rearview mirror and the darkened streets ahead. 
Either this town is overrun with zombies, and they're hoping they do the work for them, Alvarez speculated, or they have friends in town who are waiting to ambush us, Acosta added grimly. The two soldiers sat in the cab of the truck, their apprehension palpable in the heavy silence that enveloped them. Alvarez, usually composed, struggled under the weight of their precarious situation, his mind grappling for solutions amidst the darkness that cloaked the town they approached. What do we do, Alvarez? Acosta's voice cut through the stillness. Alvarez sat there, contemplating the situation, staring off into the distance and not responding. Private Acosta smacked him on the arm to get his attention, urgency etched in her voice. Sergeant, what do we do? Finally breaking free from his trance-like state, Sergeant Alvarez shook himself back to reality, his gaze steady. We're going to have to go through the town. Even if we took out the guys behind us, they're going to have reinforcements coming our way. We have to get to Spokane. Acosta nodded, determination flashing in her eyes as she readied her assault rifle, positioning it against the window's edge. Okay, I trust you. Let's hit it hard and fast. If they're waiting on us, let's not give them much time to take us down. As they neared the outskirts of the town, tension coiled in their chests with every passing building and intersecting street. The unknown threat lurking in the shadows kept them on edge, their senses heightened for any sign of danger. The initial stretch through the town passed without incident, but as they ventured deeper, Acosta's sharp eyes detected a troubling sight. We have movement, two o'clock high, she exclaimed, her voice tense with urgency. Alvarez scanned the rooftop indicated by Acosta, spotting a fleeting figure darting along the edge, shadowy and elusive against the night sky. Despite the unease gnawing at him, he pressed on, increasing their speed as they approached the next intersection. A sudden shout from Acosta alerted him to the impending danger as a speeding sedan careened toward them from a side street. With no time to react, the collision was inevitable, the impact sending shockwaves of force through the truck, jolting them violently. Get us the hell out of here, Sarge. Acosta's voice pierced the chaos, desperation evident in her tone. Alvarez pressed down on the accelerator, but the truck stubbornly refused to budge, its tires emitting an ear-splitting screech into the tense air. Suddenly, the vehicle became a target, bullets raining down upon it from behind. Acosta's gaze darted to the rear of the truck, seeking out the source of the gunfire, but her attention was hijacked by another sight, the car. The impact was perfect, its front end wedged beneath the truck, effectively immobilizing them. Before Acosta could relay this dire development to Alvarez, a hail of bullets tore through the cab, shattering the remnants of the already battered windshield. Without hesitation, both soldiers raised their weapons, firing blindly in the direction of their unseen assailants. We need cover. The truck's fucked. She shouted over the barrage of gunfire. What do you mean? Alvarez demanded, his voice strained with urgency. It's the car, Sarge. It's jammed under us. We have to move. Now, Alvarez's gaze darted to his left, catching sight of a small eatery from which a lone muzzle flash emanated. Without hesitation, he hoisted his rifle and unleashed a flurry of rounds in its direction, compelling the assailant to hastily withdraw into the establishment. We're moving, Alvarez barked. Meanwhile, Acosta, undeterred by the hail of bullets, pelting the vehicle, returned fire through the front windshield. As she scrambled across the cab, a bullet grazed her arm, while several others found their mark in the seats. Alvarez hit the ground running, his rifle raised and ready as he dashed toward the restaurant. Despite the darkness, he could make out subtle movements inside. With a firm grip on the trigger, the sergeant unleashed a volley of rounds toward the gunman. Though he couldn't see the impact, a nearby table toppled over as if struck by an unseen force. Meanwhile, Acosta fired several shots down the street, finally gaining a clear understanding of the situation. From their vantage point, they could see multiple figures within the storefronts and atop the rooftops, all fixated on their position. Get inside, Private Acosta yelled. Acosta aimed at the nearest rooftop, her shot striking the upper edge and compelling the shooter to take cover. As she pivoted to race toward the store, her heart sank at the sight of Alvarez taking a hit. The bullet tore through his upper thigh, causing him to stagger forward, the agony evident on his face. Sarge, Acosta cried out, Acosta swiftly turned and fired shots towards the rooftop, targeting the gunmen who had been tracking their movements since they approached the ambush. Though her aim missed, 
It forced the assailant to duck, buying her precious moments to reach Alvarez. With a firm grip on his shirt, she hauled him towards the safety of the building, dodging bullets, whizzing perilously close. Acosta managed to help Alvarez to his feet, their movements unsteady as they stumbled over the threshold of the restaurant, crashing to the ground in a tangled heap. Spotting a militiaman on the ground, Acosta sprang into action. She leaped to her feet, her rifle trained on the figure who stirred slightly. With determination in her eyes, she took aim at his head and pulled the trigger. Acosta dropped to one knee, her gaze fixed on the rear of the restaurant as she heard a faint noise. With every muscle tense, she remained poised, ready for any threat. Eventually, she rose, cautiously advancing toward the kitchen area. Pausing by the swinging door that partitioned the two rooms, she braced herself before darting through, half expecting to encounter resistance. Relief washed over her as she found the kitchen empty, save for the open rear door. Acosta hurried over and slammed the door shut, swiftly securing it with a metal bar to thwart any attempt to open it from the outside. The private hurried back into the main dining room, the sounds of gunshots filling the air as she stood in the doorway, witnessing the front portion of the building being torn apart by the relentless barrage of bullets. Sergeant Alvarez lay on his back, his movements labored as he slowly pulled himself away from the shattered glass, leaving a crimson trail in his wake from the gunshot wound. Jesus Christ, what do I do? Private Acosta's voice trembled as the bullets continued to fly. Chapter 2 Private Acosta suppressed her rising fear and hurried over to where Sergeant Alvarez lay, his leg wound oozing blood. She knelt beside him, taking charge immediately. Cover the window and let me see that leg, she ordered briskly, her tone betraying no hint of panic. Alvarez let out a low groan as she examined the wound, feeling the warmth of blood coating her hands. Despite the discomfort, he persisted in aiming the weapon towards the front of the building. Keep an eye on the rear. Alvarez barked. Private Acosta's response was firm, that door is locked up tight. Now be quiet and let me focus. It went straight through, she assessed. And based on the blood loss, it looks like it nicked the artery. If it had hit the artery head on, you'd be losing consciousness by now. Alvarez fired off a few shots through the window, punctuating his determination with a defiant scream. I ain't dead yet, assholes. And clearly that's not the case. Acosta added, Acosta swiftly reached down to the sergeant's belt, deftly unlatching it and yanking it off. With practiced hands, she wrapped it around the upper part of his leg, just above the wound, and fed it through into the loop. This is going to hurt, but it needs to be done, she warned. Alvarez gritted his teeth, resigned to the pain. Just do it. Acosta secured the tourniquet as tightly as possible. It's not a permanent solution, she cautioned, but it should buy us enough time to get you proper help. Alvarez chuckled weakly, a grim acceptance settling over him. Somehow I doubt those boys outside would be willing to lend me a med kit. Concern etched Acosta's features as she absorbed Alvarez's resigned tone. Alvarez, we both know I'm not getting out of this. Private Alvarez interrupted solemnly. Even if it just nicked the artery, I won't be able to walk for long. And without proper treatment, I'll bleed out in an hour or so. Acosta drew in a steadying breath, steeling herself against despair. So what do we do? The truck is stuck and we're outgunned. Alvarez gestured for Acosta's assistance in sitting up and she complied, maintaining a low profile. Their attention remained fixed on the building's front as the gunfire gradually subsided, with a few shots fired through the front window. Alvarez vocalized their presence with a resounding yell. We're still here assholes, he declared, his voice echoing with defiance. A mirthless chuckle escaped Alvarez, just making sure they haven't forgotten about us. So, what's the plan, Sarge? Acosta pressed, her gaze flickering between Alvarez and the truck. Alvarez shifted his focus towards the truck, peering through his scope to gain a closer examination. A nod of understanding followed as the details crystallized before him. The car isn't fused to the truck, he observed, his tone deliberate yet composed. It's merely wedged underneath the wheel well. The windshield barely holds on to the frame, providing little reinforcement. If those guys weren't shooting at us, we could do something about it. Alvarez acknowledged her point with a subtle nod. I'm getting to that, he assured her. Staying low, Alvarez maneuvered towards the front of the building, intent on surveying the rooftop just above the truck. 
he spotted a lone gunman stationed atop the building across the street, just behind the truck. He swept the ground floor of the buildings just behind the truck, not seeing any signs of movement. Okay, he reported, keeping his voice low. The only one I can see behind us is the sniper on the roof. If you can take him out, it'll give you a chance to move the car. Acosta's brow furrowed with concern. And the others? I'll handle them, Alvarez asserted firmly. Come on now, Sarge. Acosta's protest hung in the air. I said I'll handle it, Alvarez said, his tone brooking no argument. But you need to move. Acosta shook her head, her heart sinking at the realization that Alvarez is preparing to trade his life for hers. Alvarez took notice and spoke up forcefully. Get out the back. Don't worry about locking it up. These boys have explosives, so if they want in here bad enough, they're going to get in here. I want you to run back a couple blocks and cross over to the other side of the street. There's still enough darkness left. They won't be able to see you. Reluctantly, Acosta nodded. Okay, I can do that. Good Alvarez affirmed, his eyes scanning the surroundings. Because they're most likely holding us here to wait on reinforcements. We don't have a lot of time. As Acosta prepared to depart, Alvarez's hand instinctively reached for his radio. He shook his head as he did. What is it? Acosta inquired. My radio, Alvarez muttered, cursing under his breath. It's still in the truck? We're just going to have to go off a timer then. Acosta decided. Does five minutes give you enough time? Make it seven, Acosta requested, already formulating her plan of attack. If I'm going to take out that sniper, I need time to find a way onto the roof. Alvarez nodded with Acosta, their gazes shifting to their watches, preparing to synchronize their timings. But before pressing the button, Acosta's expression betrayed a flicker of pain, her eyes reflecting the weight of the moment. You make sure you get to safety and live a good life, Alvarez urged, a ghost of a smile softening his features. Don't make me come haunt your ass. Despite the gravity of their situation, Acosta couldn't help but chuckle at his remark. Come on, Alvarez encouraged gently, his tone belying his own turmoil. You gotta get moving. Acosta nodded briskly and swiftly retreated to the rear of the building. She removed the metal bar securing the door and pushed it open forcefully, hoping to provoke any potential ambusher into revealing themselves. Finding no immediate threat, she cautiously poked her head out into the alleyway, scanning for any signs of danger. Satisfied that the coast was clear, she took a deep breath before darting into the narrow passage, leaving the door ajar behind her. She rushed away from the ongoing firefight, where Alvarez exchanged gunfire with the militia. Feeling confident that she was alone in the alley, Acosta broke into a sprint, determined to reach her intended position as quickly as possible. After covering two blocks, she veered towards the highway. Pausing momentarily at the roadside, she glanced in both directions, relieved to still observe muzzle flashes emanating from the nearby restaurant. Get moving, girl, she muttered to herself. Acosta dashed across the street, her focus fixed on the path ahead. As she neared cover at the adjacent building, a glimpse of the gunman caught her attention from the corner of her eye, emboldened as he extended the rifle's barrel over the rooftop's edge. Halting her sprint, Acosta opted for a swift but quieter approach. Locating the building where the shooter lurked, she identified the ladder leading to his perch. With a leap, Acosta grabbed hold of the ladder's lowest rung, hoisting herself up with ease. Her ascent was swift, her muscles responding effortlessly to the task. Just before hoisting herself onto the rooftop, she stole a glance at the scene. The ladder positioned her at the opposite corner from the gunman, necessitating a silent traverse across the entire expanse if she intended to execute a stealthy takedown. Acosta's gaze pierced past the gunman, scanning down the street, a couple of blocks where she spotted another adversary on this side of the road, standing on the roof, fixated solely on Alvarez. Finally poised to strike, Acosta heaved herself onto the rooftop and advanced towards the militiaman. With her rifle aimed at him, she moved forward, the gunfire around the truck masked her approach. Closing the distance to within a few yards, she slung her rifle over her shoulder, deftly drawing her handgun and knife simultaneously, maintaining her steady advance. The gunman remained fixated on the restaurant, sporadically firing shots and engaging in a tense exchange of fire with Alvarez. Despite his immobilized state, the sergeant valiantly contributed to Acosta's advantage. Stealthily, 
the private crept up to the militiamen, who remained oblivious to her presence. With swift precision, she drove the tip of her knife into the base of his skull. He immediately went limp, collapsing in a heap on the roof. Despite the gunshots echoing nearby, she could still hear the disturbing sound of blood gurgling. Acosta reacted swiftly, dropping to her knees and seizing his sniper rifle. She took aim towards the opposing sniper positioned just a couple of blocks away on her side of the street. She calculated the distance in an instant, then squeezed the trigger. She observed through the scope as the bullet tore through the adversary's face. Acosta shifted to the rooftop's edge, peering down at Alvarez, barely visible in the dim light. She gave him a reassuring thumbs up before withdrawing back onto the roof, kneeling beside the dying militiaman. From her vantage point, she surveyed the truck below, relieved to see that Alvarez's diagnosis was correct. Just have to get down there and pop it in reverse, she muttered to herself. But as she scanned the street, she noted multiple muzzle flashes from nearby buildings, estimating at least five assailants. Glancing at her watch, she realized time was running short. However, her thoughts were interrupted by the sight of headlights in the distance, coming from the rear. With scant moments to decide, she hurried to the rooftop's edge, looking down at Alvarez, who was paying her no attention. She thought for a moment before looking at her sniper rifle. This is a terrible idea. Acosta aimed it towards Alvarez, ensuring her shot would only get his attention without causing harm. The bullet struck the floor beside him, eliciting a startled reaction before he comprehended her message. Alvarez mouthed the words, what the fuck in her direction? and she replied with silent hand signals indicating that a vehicle was approaching from behind, and she required a few more minutes. Alvarez nodded in understanding and signaled his agreement with a thumbs up before returning to his task of keeping the militiamen at bay. Acosta swiftly retrieved her assault rifle, positioning herself next to the fallen figure and training her gaze towards the restaurant, all the while striving to merge seamlessly with the surrounding crowd. With a subtle shift of her head, she feigned concentration on the eatery, while surreptitiously monitoring the approaching truck. Her eyes tracked its progress as it halted just a block away from the vehicle, its abrupt stop catching her attention, especially the bullet-ridden hood and windshield. So you're the assholes that were following us, she muttered under her breath, anticipation tingling in her veins. You're about to get one hell of a surprise. Chapter 3 Acosta stood frozen, her gaze fixed on the scene unfolding before her. Four men disembarked from the truck, displaying no sense of haste as they leisurely organized themselves into a cohesive unit. With measured steps, they approached the building adjacent to the restaurant, positioning themselves directly opposite Acosta, poised for an assault on Alvarez. She observed as they communicated via radio, and within moments, the sound of gunfire echoing from the distance grew louder. Acosta bided her time, waiting until the men shifted their focus towards the restaurant before making her move ensuring she remained unnoticed and unimpeded by their scrutiny. In one fluid motion, Acosta swung her rifle around and unleashed a barrage of bullets upon the unsuspecting men. With unwavering focus, she kept the barrel trained on them, relentlessly squeezing the trigger. They were caught off guard, unable to react to the sudden onslaught as 30 rounds tore through the air in a matter of seconds. A couple managed to turn towards Acosta, but their efforts were futile. They only succeeded in facing the incoming bullets head-on instead of from the side. Acosta swiftly discarded the spent magazine from her rifle and seamlessly inserted a fresh one, all the while maintaining her intense gaze upon the group. She held her aim steady for several tense moments, ensuring that the threat had been neutralized before lowering her weapon. Yeah, you bitches stay down, she declared tersely a defiant assertion of her dominance. Acknowledging Alvarez with a thumbs up, Acosta swiftly retreated to the ladder, descending with purpose before hastening toward the adjacent block. Approaching the enemy pickup, Acosta scoured its contents, a fruitless search for valuable intel or resources. Come on, where's the good stuff at? She muttered in frustration before redirecting her focus toward the transport truck. Remaining low to avoid detection, she crept toward the vehicle, shielded from view by the obstruction of a wedged car. Upon reaching the vehicle, Acosta was relieved as she discovered the keys still in the ignition. At least one thing's going right today, she muttered sardonically, slipping into the driver's seat and igniting the engine with a turn of the key. As she hit the gas, the tires screeched in protest, Acosta wrestled with the vehicle, trying to will it free. Come on, you bastard, 
Come on, she urged fervently, the threat of enemy fire intensifying with each passing moment. As Acosta persisted in her efforts to free the car, the deafening crack of gunfire pierced the air, sending bullets tearing through the side window. She instinctively ducked, narrowly avoiding the deadly trajectory aimed at her head. She reacted swiftly, drawing her handgun and aiming it down the street. Her target was clear, a militiaman who had dared to venture from the relative safety of the store into the street. She took aim, squeezing the trigger, as the car continued to struggle to break free. Damn it, she cursed as her first few shots missed the target, allowing him an opportunity to return fire. Bullets flew towards her, some grazing the door frame before penetrating the cab, their trajectory altered as it struck the metallic frame. One round landed perilously close to Acosta, embedding itself in the seat beside her, while another lodged into the dashboard. Swiftly, she retaliated, pulling the trigger rapidly. As her shots echoed, the car began its retreat, the rear end swaying as the tires clawed against the pavement, the hood yielding under the pressure. After the final click of her emptied handgun, silence fell, broken only by the ominous creaking of metal under strain. Acosta swiftly ejected the magazine from her handgun and reached for another. As she did, her gaze darted down the street, where the ominous silhouettes of two gunmen emerged on the sidewalk, their rifles trained squarely on her, leaving her with little hope of escape. A heavy sigh escaped her lips, resignation settling in as she accepted her fate. Yet, before the gunmen could unleash their deadly volleys, their attention abruptly shifted, panic evident in their movements as they sprayed bullets toward an unseen threat on the other side of the truck. In the chaos, Acosta witnessed the impact of the gunfire, one of the assailants crumpling to the ground as bullets found their mark on his vest. Peering beneath the truck, she caught sight of Sergeant Alvarez bravely stepping into the fray, drawing the enemy fire away from her. Alvarez, she called out, her voice laden with a mix of relief and urgency as hope flickered amidst the chaos of battle. Acosta stood frozen for a split second, her heart pounding in her chest as she watched Alvarez hobble down the street, drawing the relentless fire of the gunman. She instinctively raised her freshly reloaded handgun, ready to return fire, but her actions were interrupted by the sudden release of the sedan from the truck. The car careened backwards, its speed unchecked as it swerved uncontrollably down the narrow side street. Acosta lunged forward, her hands grasping for the steering wheel, but it was too late. The sedan slammed violently into the side of a nearby building, the impact jolting her senses. Dazed but determined, Acosta quickly regained her bearings as the gunshots continued to echo dangerously close by. She emerged from the wreckage, her rifle at the ready as she sprinted towards cover along the side of the building. Peering cautiously around the corner, she spotted one of the assailants writhing in pain on the ground, seeking refuge behind a meager trash can for cover. Muzzle flashes illuminated the storefront nearby. Acosta scanned the street, her gaze locking onto Alvarez, pinned down behind a metal trash can, his position under heavy fire. Their eyes met briefly, a silent exchange of acknowledgement passing between them. Acosta began signaling her intention to flank the assailants, but Alvarez vehemently shook his head, refusing her plan. Frustration boiled within her as she cursed silently, but Alvarez's resolve was unwavering gesturing towards the truck with an unmistakable directive. Reluctantly, Acosta acquiesced to his command. She prepared to execute her next move, darting around the corner and unleashing a barrage of gunfire towards the grounded assailant, neutralizing his threat. Moving quickly, she reached the passenger side of the truck, flinging open the door and sliding into the driver's seat. As she took control, Alvarez emerged from cover, providing covering fire to suppress the militia's advance. With the engine roaring to life, Acosta threw the truck into reverse, slamming into the pickup truck with force, sending it careening off the road. After making a hard turn, she navigated through the back streets, evading potential threats. Guess they put all their eggs in that ambush basket, she muttered to herself, her focus unwavering as she accelerated down the road, wary of any lurking danger. Acosta maintained her pace down the road until she reached its end. There, she made a sharp turn towards the highway at the northern outskirts of town, anticipating opposition. Upon rejoining the highway, she grimaced as she encountered a blockade formed by overturned vehicles just to the south of her position, guarded by a contingent of armed men. An uneasy silence descended 
when her gaze met that of one of the militia members, who had his firearm trained in the wrong direction, evidently unprepared for the transport truck to skirt past the barricade. They locked eyes for a fleeting moment, both parties registering disbelief in the unexpected turn of events. There's another one coming. I swear, she declared, her voice cutting through the tension as she surged past the barricade, bullets smacking off the truck's armor. As she merged onto the highway, Acosta encountered two pickup trucks poised for pursuit, their intentions clear. She veered towards them, executing a calculated maneuver to disable her pursuers. Demolition derby time, she exclaimed, her pulse racing as she plowed into the pickup trucks, sending them careening off the road in a chaotic frenzy. That should buy me a few minutes, she muttered, her eyes fixed on the road ahead as she pressed onward towards her destination. Meanwhile, Sergeant Alvarez remained locked in a fierce firefight with the militia inside the store. Undeterred by the odds stacked against him, he taunted his adversaries with defiant bravado. How's it feel, boys? Knowing it takes half a dozen of you just to take me out. He jeered, his laughter echoing amidst the hail of gunfire. As shots peppered the air around him, Sergeant Alvarez emerged from cover, defiant and unyielding. He unleashed a volley of rounds before hobbling back towards the safety of the restaurant. But his retreat was met with a strike from one of the militiamen, a sharp, searing pain ripping through his side as a bullet found its mark. Alvarez's rifle slipped from his grasp, his body faltering as he stumbled to the ground, the weight of his injuries bearing down on him. Instead of delivering a fatal blow, the militiamen approached cautiously, his weapon trained on the wounded sergeant, wary of any signs of resistance. Ignoring the agony coursing through him, Alvarez pressed on, his movements faltering as he collapsed against the cold sidewalk outside the restaurant. Blood oozed from his wound as he struggled to maintain his composure, a wince betraying the intensity of his pain. With a mixture of resignation and defiance, Alvarez raised his hands in mock surrender. However, he lowered one hand towards the wound in his gut to put pressure on it. Yeah, well, you get the idea, he quipped. The militiaman maintained a cautious distance, his rifle poised and ready. Just don't make any sudden movements, and you're good, he warned, his tone tinged with a hint of begrudging respect. Alvarez's laughter rang out amidst the tense standoff. Mighty kind of you, he replied, pausing as if he was searching for a name. Mike, the militiaman offered. Alvarez came the wary response, the weight of his injuries evident in every word. What are you, a captain? Mike inquired. If I was a captain, I wouldn't be anywhere near this place. Alvarez chuckled, a trace of bitterness creeping into his tone. I'd have my feet propped up on a desk somewhere in Seattle. Must be nice. Mike mused, a hint of envy coloring his words. Sergeant Alvarez sighed. Tell me about it. I'm just a lowly sergeant, which is why they had me on this suicide run, he muttered. Mike, standing nearby, nodded sympathetically. Well, Sergeant, I'm sorry that you didn't get that desk to put your feet on. If it's any consolation, my people didn't get that either, he replied. And who are your people, Mike? You couldn't spot my rank. So I assume you didn't serve, Alvarez asked, his tone edged with curiosity. No, sir, I didn't, Mike admitted. I lived up the road in Rosilla and worked in a mechanic shop before all this. Fixing cars is a long way from the battlefield, Mike. Why would you try and take my life? Alvarez inquired. It's nothing personal, Alvarez. I'm just helping the people who helped me and mine. When all this started, the military and the government were nowhere to be found. Came to find out through my cousin down in Lawrence that you cut and ran down to Kansas. We didn't know what to do. Those things kept wandering down from Spokane. Nearly overran us a few times before one of the militias showed up. Mike explained earnestly. Alvarez paused, considering Mike's words carefully. And they helped protect you. He asked, his tone softened by understanding. Mike nodded in agreement as he listened to Alvarez's words. They helped us beat back the hordes at the gates, helped us set up proper defenses, gave us food and weapons. They were there when you weren't, Mike affirmed. Alvarez gave a solemn nod before an unexpected burst of laughter escaped him, surprising Mike. What's so funny? Mike asked, puzzled by the sudden change in mood. It's just even in the zombie apocalypse, the story is still the same. Old dumbasses thousands of miles away making decisions on a whim that puts people like us in unwinnable situations like this. Alvarez chuckled, his laughter echoing in the tense atmosphere. 
Mike couldn't help but chuckle in response, a smile breaking across his face. So you know what I'm talking about then, Alvarez inquired. My uncle was in the service. When he'd get a couple of whiskeys in him, he'd start going off like you just did. Mike shared a sense of camaraderie forming between them. For what it's worth, Mike, I'm sorry. If it were up to me, we would have stayed and fought alongside you. Alvarez confessed, his tone sincere. I appreciate that, Alvarez. And for what it's worth, I'm sorry that our guns are the reason you're sitting there in that condition, Mike replied, his voice laced with regret. Alvarez nodded in appreciation, though it was accompanied by a wet, hacking cough that sent a spray of blood into the air. He grimaced, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand. Well, I think it's about that time, Mike. If you want to do the honors, Alvarez said, his voice strained with pain. Mike hesitated, his grip tightening on the rifle. Never shot a man before? Alvarez asked, his gaze steady despite the weakness in his voice. It's a lot different when they're firing back at you, Mike admitted. Ain't that the truth? Alvarez replied. Alvarez raised his bloody hand, gesturing for Mike to approach. With a shaky breath, Mike lowered his weapon, watching as Alvarez undid the belt on his leg. A moment later, the blood flow intensified, staining the ground beneath them. If you don't mind, I'll just hang out here for a bit, Alvarez said weakly, his voice barely above a whisper. Mike glanced down, the sight of the blood unsettling. I hope you're off to a better place, Sergeant, he said softly, offering a solemn nod of respect. Me too, Mike. But I wouldn't bet on it, Alvarez replied, his words tinged with resignation. Alvarez watched as Mike walked off towards the others, his figure blending into the shadows of the store where they were hiding. With a heavy sigh, Alvarez shifted his gaze upwards, towards the sky where the sun was beginning to rise, casting a warm glow over the landscape and painting the clouds with shades of red and orange. Well, there are worse final sights I could have had in this world, Alvarez murmured to himself, a sense of peace settling over him in the quiet moments before the end. Chapter 4 Cillian tore down the highway, his dirt bike roaring beneath him as he pushed it to its limits. For the first time in hours, he let go of the constant vigilance, no longer glancing anxiously over his shoulder for potential threats. Yet, a nagging sense of danger loomed ahead, an invisible specter urging caution, despite his urgency to catch up with Alvarez and Acosta. You two better be rolling into Spokane right about now, Cillian muttered under his breath, his voice lost amidst the rumble of the engine. Cillian struggled to reassure himself about the safety of the duo, but his efforts proved futile. It took him a moment to dispel the lingering negative thoughts, redirecting his focus to the road ahead. With the sun getting a little higher in the sky, its rays illuminated the landscape, making the distant town of Colfax easily discernible on the horizon. As he neared the town, he eased off the throttle, allowing the vehicle to coast towards the buildings. A few blocks into town, his attention was drawn to a pickup truck obstructing the road. The unmistakable remnants of a recent battle marred the once peaceful landscape. Please be okay, please be okay, Cillian pleaded silently as he maneuvered his bike closer, his senses on high alert. Taking cover behind nearby buildings, he cautiously advanced, scanning the area for any signs of danger. His breath caught in his throat as he spotted Sergeant Alvarez slumped against the wall of a nearby restaurant motionless. Oh God, Alvarez! Cillian's voice cracked with anguish as he dashed towards his fallen comrade, dread pooling his stomach as he registered the crimson stains marring Alvarez's uniform. Kneeling beside the sergeant, Cillian reached out tentatively, recoiling at the cold touch of lifelessness that greeted his fingertips. Tears threatened to spill from his eyes as he struggled to come to terms with the loss, his grief palpable in the silent exchange with his fallen friend. Rest easy, my friend, Cillian whispered hoarsely, a futile attempt to offer solace in the face of the unfathomable. Before he could rise to his feet, the chilling sound of a rifle being primed shattered the moment of mourning, sending a jolt of adrenaline coursing through his veins. With a sinking realization, Cillian raised his hands in surrender, his pulse quickening as he turned to face the looming threat. A stranger, armed and wary, confronted him with steely resolve the barrel of his rifle aimed center mass. Go on and turn around now, slowly. The stranger commanded, his voice a low rumble of authority tinged with caution. Zillian complied, meeting the stranger's gaze with a mixture of apprehension and defiance as he took in the tense standoff. Following instructions, 
Cillian complied, spotting Mike standing there with a rifle aimed directly at him. When Mike recognized Cillian as just a teenager, he lowered his weapon slightly, though he kept his finger close to the trigger. He was a friend of yours, I take it, Mike inquired. Cillian nodded slowly. Just met him a few days ago, but yeah, I'd consider him a friend, he confirmed. I'm sorry for your loss, son. He seemed like a good man, Mike offered sympathetically. Despite his efforts to remain calm, Cillian felt anger bubbling up inside him, struggling to keep his voice steady but faltering slightly. You shot him up like he was target practice. You don't get to comment on what kind of person he was. He retorted, his voice laced with bitterness and grief. Fair enough, Mike responded tersely. Cillian's voice trembled with emotion as he questioned, Did you kill my other friend too? The woman, Mike clarified, shaking his head. No, she's alive. At least she was when she drove away. Confusion clouded Cillian's expression as he processed the information, shaking his head in disbelief. There's no way she would leave Alvarez behind. He protested a knot of despair forming in his chest at the thought of her abandonment. He sacrificed himself so she could get away. The stranger explained, his words a bitter pill to swallow as Cillian wrestled with the weight of their choices. Well, come on then. Get it over with, Cillian muttered his voice tinged with resignation as he braced himself for the final reckoning. To his surprise, the stranger hesitated, his expression softened by an unexpected display of compassion. Are you really that eager to die? The stranger countered, his tone tempered with a hint of empathy that caught Cillian off guard. It's better than being locked up, or tortured, or whatever you guys have planned for me. Get back on your bike and go, kid, Mike urged. Cillian's confusion was palpable, as he glanced back at Mike, whose expression remained sincere. You're just going to let me go. Just like that, like nothing happened, Cillian questioned incredulously. Mike maintained his calm demeanor as he responded, Well, nothing happened between us. I was told to stop a truck. You're not driving a truck. So, unless you decide to be a moron and pull that rifle off your back and force me to defend myself, you can be on your way. Relieved, Cillian slowly lowered his hands as Mike also lowered his weapon. With cautious steps, he made his way back towards his bike. Just some friendly advice, though, Mike added, his tone carrying a hint of warning. I'd take the long way around. I have some friends up near the northern part of town who aren't as literal with their job descriptions, if you get my drift. Acknowledging the advice with a nod, Cillian continued to back away from Mike, maintaining a careful distance until he reached his bike. Relief and confusion mingled in his thoughts as he hurriedly mounted his ride and sped away, leaving the encounter behind him. What in the holy hell was that? He muttered to himself. Cillian revved the engine of his bike, the roar cutting through the quiet streets as he executed a daring burnout before peeling away, leaving a trail of smoke in his wake. He didn't allow himself to dwell on the recent encounter, knowing better than to scrutinize good fortune too closely. Guiding his bike toward the eastern outskirts of town, Cillian navigated several blocks before finding himself amidst the open fields. He pushed further, putting ample distance between himself and any potential threats. Despite his efforts, the bike's churned-up dirt served as a conspicuous marker in the barren landscape. As he rode on, the solitary expanse was shattered by the sharp crack of a distant rifle. Cillian instinctively turned his gaze back toward town, spotting armed figures lining the northern edge, their weapons trained in his direction. Quickly assessing his options, Cillian sought cover behind a sturdy tree, pausing to survey the unfolding situation. He knew better than to recklessly speed past the armed men, opting instead to strategize rather than risk entangling himself in another rolling gun battle. Cillian swiftly retrieved binoculars from his bag, doing his best to ignore the bullets coming his way. Peering through the lenses, he carefully observed the unfolding chaos. Amidst the hail of gunfire, he spotted several men positioned near an overturned truck, their weapons trained on him with deadly intent. Meanwhile, a small group struggled to free another truck stuck in a nearby ditch, their efforts hampered by the unforgiving terrain. Cillian's mind raced as he pieced together the scene before him. Acosta must still be going, he muttered to himself, his voice barely audible over the gunfire. Cillian stood by, observing intently as the group worked together to extricate the truck from the ditch. Once freed, several of them clambered into the back of the vehicle before it roared to life, tearing off in a northerly direction along the highway. 
If she's still going, she's all alone and going to need my help. Cillian muttered to himself. He hesitated, his mind grappling with the daunting prospect of chasing after the truck. He knew the risks involved. One wrong move, one slight bump, and he could be left sprawled on the pavement. His life snuffed out in an instant. All right, you won't be any help to her if you're dead. Let them get a head start, give them a couple of minutes to gain some distance. Then, when they're out of the truck, that's when you make your move. At least then, you'll stand a fighting chance. Remaining low and vigilant, Cillian monitored the gunman's movements, waiting until they believed he was dead before making his move. Get up and go, man. Acosta needs your help. With a swift kick, he ignited the engine and throttled forward. Within moments, he was careening across the open field, his body jostling with each bump in the terrain. It wasn't until a few moments later that the gunmen caught wind of his escape. In a futile attempt to take him out, they discharged a flurry of shots, but their aim faltered, missing their target entirely. Realizing the futility of their efforts, they ceased fire as Cillian distanced himself. Upon reaching the highway, Cillian braced himself, steadying his bike before accelerating. Despite pushing the throttle to its limits, the elusive truck remained beyond his line of sight, shrouded by the distance. Bout began to gnaw at his resolve. I should have spotted them by now, Cillian muttered to himself, his voice tinged with frustration. Did I wait too long? Have I missed my chance? Cillian continued along the desolate road, passing a weathered signpost indicating Rosilla is 15 miles away. Please, let it be empty, he pleaded silently his heart pounding with apprehension. Cillian pressed on, the road stretching endlessly before him as minutes ticked by without a glimpse of either the enemy truck or Acosta's vehicle. The absence of the trucks provided a slight relief, but anxiety still gripped him tightly. As the outskirts of Rosilla loomed into view, he eased off the throttle, slowing his pace. His heart sank as he saw the transport truck stationed ominously in the center of the road. Oh no, oh no, Cillian veered off to the roadside, his heart pounding with a mix of frustration and regret. Retrieving his binoculars, he focused his gaze on the scene unfolding before him. The pickup truck he had trailed parked adjacent to the transport, surrounded by armed gunmen eagerly rifling through its contents. Their jubilant cheers reverberated in the air as they uncovered their prize. Damn it, Acosta, Cillian muttered bitterly, a pain of guilt piercing through him. I'm sorry. I should have acted sooner, taken them on. As he sat there consumed by distress, the sharp crack of gunfire shattered the silence, echoing ominously through the atmosphere. Straining his senses, Cillian pinpointed the origin of the gunfire. A series of bursts emanating from the western sector of town, predominantly residential. His resolve hardened. Hang on, Acosta. He declared determination infusing his voice. I'm coming for you. With swift decisiveness, Cillian mounted his bike, revving the engine to life before tearing off towards the western reaches of town, his only thought being to reach Acosta in time. Chapter 5 Acosta navigated the battered transport truck along the road toward Rosilla, its destination looming less than a mile ahead. The wind whistled through the gaps in the windshield, the glass barely clinging to its frame. For a fleeting moment, her thoughts veered towards Alvarez, a surge of emotion threatening to overwhelm her. Yet she pushed the distraction aside, realizing the urgency of maintaining her focus. Before the truck could even fully enter the town limits, trouble showed itself. Movement caught her eye from the second building to her right. Two gunmen emerged, their figures silhouetted against the storefront as they unleashed a volley of shots in the truck's direction. Their marksmanship proved lacking, the bullets merely grazing the vehicle's side. Nonetheless, their attack demanded her immediate attention. Acosta drew her handgun, preparing to return fire. However, the diversion worked, as another figure, a militiaman charged forth from a nearby store. In his grasp, he wielded a menacing metal spike strip. With a forceful throw, he launched the metal strip across the pavement, spanning the entire width of the road. Acosta never saw it until the ominous sound of tires bursting pierced the air. Suddenly, the steering wheel jerked in her hands the truck lurching uncontrollably as traction vanished. Metal rims screeched against the pavement, emitting a deafening grinding noise that reverberated through the air. Stranded with all four tires shredded, Acosta had no recourse but to slam on the brakes. As it settled in the middle of the road, bullets began to rain down upon it from behind. 
damn it, she cursed. Acosta's adrenaline surged as she snatched her rifle from the seat and forcefully swung open the driver's side door. Without hesitation, she trained her sights on the man who had flung the spike strip, unleashing a flurry of shots in his direction as he retreated into the safety of the building's interior. Utilizing the truck as makeshift cover against the decoy gunman's barrage, Acosta sprinted across the street with single-minded focus, paying no heed to the bullets whizzing past her. Acosta reached the narrow alleyway nestled between two storefronts. Taking up a strategic position near the alley's entrance, she aimed her rifle back toward the truck, her mind racing as she assessed the unfolding situation. For a fleeting moment, she thought she could gain control of the situation and retake the truck as the only gunshots were coming from the rear of the truck. However, her optimism was abruptly shattered by the thunderous roar of two approaching trucks hurtling down the highway from the north. Acosta pivoted swiftly, unleashing a barrage of shots in their direction, only to be met with a savage onslaught of bullets in return. Some struck the wall she had sought cover behind, compelling her to hastily retreat deeper into the narrow confines of the alleyway. As she sprinted along the shadowy passage, thoughts raced through Acosta's mind. I have to protect the truck. She reminded herself. Yet survival was paramount, a mantra echoing in her mind as she fled down the alleyway, bullets grazing perilously close. She pumped her legs with all her might, reaching the rear of the buildings, where a road intersected with a row of houses marking the beginning of the expansive neighborhood extending for several blocks. No sooner had she taken cover at the back of the building, the crackle of gunfire erupted from the nearby highway, bullets striking the edge of the wall mere inches away from her, sending shards of debris flying in all directions. Gotta find cover, she muttered, her urgency matched only by the intensity of the firefight. Acosta identified the house nearest to the alleyway and sprinted towards its front door, with adrenaline coursing through her veins, she unleashed a powerful front kick, shattering the door away from its frame. As she rushed inside, she barely had a moment to catch her breath before the staccato of gunfire erupted outside, pelting the front of the house and sending splinters of wood scattering through the air. Quickly dropping to the ground and maneuvering herself, Acosta seized the door and pulled it partially closed, creating a narrow opening that served as her vantage point. She extended her rifle through the gap, returning fire. Two militiamen sprinted up the alleyway, their weapons blazing in her direction. Despite her best efforts, Acosta's shots failed to find their mark, but her fierce retaliation was enough to drive the assailants to seek refuge further down the alley. A brief lull descended upon the battlefield, during which Acosta peered through her scope, attempting to discern the whereabouts of her adversaries. However, before she could gain any meaningful insight, the silence was shattered by the distant shouts emanating from the alleyway. You are outnumbered and outgunned, the militiaman taunted, his words laced with false bravado. Not the first time that's happened to me today, asshole. Acosta retorted, her defiance unwavering. We don't want to hurt you, the militiaman countered, his tone surprisingly conciliatory. Just put down your gun and come out with your hands up. And then what? You and your scumbag friends have your way with me. Hell no. The militiaman responded, a hint of humor coloring his words. My wife would cut my balls off and hang them on the tree, like they were a Christmas ornament, if I tried anything like that. Sounds like she has you on a short leash, Acosta remarked dryly. You bet she does. The militiaman admitted, she's also one hell of a cook, and if you give yourself up, I promise I can get her to whip you up something tasty. Because I'm guessing it's been a while since you've had a hot home-cooked meal. Acosta entertained the notion of accepting the unexpected offer of hospitality for a fleeting moment. The promise of a home-cooked meal, a luxury she hadn't enjoyed in weeks, tugged at her weary resolve. Yet, the memory of recent hostilities quickly quashed any inclination towards trust. I do appreciate the hospitality offer, she acknowledged, her tone tinged with skepticism. It's just, you guys have been shooting at me and my friends for the past few days, and I'm the only one left standing so you'll have to forgive me if I don't take you at your word. Her attention swiftly redirected towards the present threat as she observed movement down the street. Two figures attempted to flank her position, prompting a rapid response from Acosta. And you assholes are still trying to take me out, she exclaimed, her voice laced with defiance as she unleashed a barrage of gunfire towards the advancing assailants. As the symphony of bullets ripped through the front of the house, 
Acosta emptied her magazine, forcing the flankers to retreat momentarily. With a break in the action, she got to her feet to retreat. Acosta hurried through the house toward the kitchen at the rear. Her heart racing, she was abruptly startled by movement in the dimly lit corner of the room. She instinctively raised her rifle, aiming at the source of the motion. To her relief and surprise, she found herself facing not a threat, but an older woman seated on the floor, cradling two young children in her arms. The sight momentarily disarmed Acosta, her tense muscles relaxing as she realized the innocence of the occupants she had stumbled upon. Quickly recognizing her mistake, Acosta lowered her weapon, the tension in the room easing as she offered a reassuring gesture to the frightened trio. I'm sorry, I'm not going to hurt you, Acosta reassured them. Her rifle momentarily trained on the trio before she hastened out the back door, leaving the family to their sanctuary. What the hell is going on? She muttered to herself, confusion mingling with frustration. None of those things roaming around a little old lady baking cookies? Shaking off the distraction, she refocused on her objective. It doesn't matter. What matters is getting back to the truck and taking it back. Despite her resolve, doubt gnawed at her determination. I can't do it by myself, she admitted, a pang of vulnerability surfacing. A quick inventory of her ammunition confirmed her predicament. Even if I could take everybody out, where would I get the fresh tires for the truck? Caught in the throes of indecision, Acosta's deliberation was abruptly interrupted by movement nearby. Reacting swiftly, she raised her rifle, prepared to confront the approaching threat. Yeah, come on, show yourself, she challenged, her voice edged with defiance. It took a tense moment before they emerged from their hiding spots, their overconfidence proving to be their downfall. Acosta swiftly reacted, squeezing the trigger of her rifle and sending a round hurtling towards them. The bullet found its mark, tearing into the shoulder of one of the gunmen and sending them crashing to the ground in agony. But her victory was short-lived. In the blink of an eye, four more assailants unleashed a barrage of gunfire from various vantage points. Some positioned themselves at the flanks of nearby houses, while others fired from the windows, their coordinated attack leaving Acosta with little room to maneuver. Bullets tore into the earth and shredded the surrounding foliage, driving Acosta back behind cover as she returned fire. The rhythmic exchange of gunfire echoed through the air, punctuated by the metallic click of empty magazines being discarded and replaced. Just as she prepared to engage her next target, Acosta's attention was drawn to a lone figure sprinting along the street beside her, making a desperate dash for the house behind her. She emerged from her hiding spot, intent on reaching the safety of the nearby building. However, her advance was abruptly halted as a hail of bullets rained down around her, thwarting her attempt to break free from cover. Damn it, she muttered. Her mind raced as she weighed her options, the urgency of the situation pressing down on her. There was no time to waste, yet the path ahead seemed obscured by uncertainty. With a quick decision, she veered towards the side of the house, hoping to cut off the flanking gunman her heart pounding, Acosta returned fire towards the gunman trailing behind her, using the shots to create a brief window of cover as she darted from her hiding spot. Making swift strides away from the tree, she barely made it several steps before the sound of gunfire echoed once more. Reaching the relative safety of the house's side, she could feel the impact of bullets striking the structure as she sprinted alongside it. She continued running forward while firing backwards, hoping to force the gunman back behind cover and buy herself time to escape. As Acosta pivoted to sprint towards the front of the house, her heart leaped into her throat as she spotted the gunman who had flanked her emerging from cover. She raised her rifle in tandem with his, but she was a heartbeat too slow. Before the assailant could squeeze the trigger, his attention veered to the right, a perplexed expression crossing his face as he attempted to adjust his aim. Acosta's confusion turned to astonishment as she witnessed Cillian hurtling towards them on his dirt bike, executing a wheelie maneuver. In a desperate attempt to defend himself, the militiaman tried to fire off rounds, but before he could fully react, the front wheel of Cillian's bike connected with his face, sending him crashing to the ground in a sickening collision of metal and flesh. The impact sent both the assailant and Cillian sprawling to the ground, the force of the collision jarring them all. The dirt bike skidded to a halt a short distance away, the engine sputtering as it settled. Without hesitation, Acosta closed the distance, her movement swift and decisive as she approached the fallen gunman. 
She pumped several rounds into his chest, ensuring he posed no further threat. Cillian, are you okay? She called out, concern evident in her voice, as she rushed to his side. Though shaken by the impact, Cillian rallied quickly, the urgency of their predicament spurring him into action. Yeah, I'm fine, but we need to go, he urged, his voice urgent as gunfire echoed ominously in the distance. We can't. We have to get the truck back, Acosta countered, her determination unyielding even in the face of mounting danger. But right now, we have to get someplace safe, Cillian insisted. Cillian gestured towards the ongoing gunfire. Acosta's steely resolve flickered with the desire to stand her ground, but ultimately, she acquiesced. Okay, but we're not done with this town yet, she declared, her voice tinged with determination as she prepared to retreat. With a nod of agreement, Cillian retrieved the bike, motioning for Acosta to join him on the back. Don't worry, I'm a safe driver. He reassured her, his tone laced with a hint of bravado. Acosta nodded tersely, mounting the bike as Cillian revved the engine. The bike surged forward, hurtling through the streets with reckless abandon. Acosta remained vigilant, scanning their surroundings for any sign of pursuit. Several blocks later, Cillian veered towards the highway, prompting Acosta to draw her handgun in anticipation of confrontation. But to her bewilderment, Cillian steered them northward, away from the truck and the heart of the conflict. Frustration boiled over, and Acosta unleashed her frustration in a torrent of angry words. Where the hell are you going? She demanded. We have to get out of town. Cillian insisted, his resolve unwavering despite Acosta's protests. Not without the truck, she shot back, her tone bordering on desperation. Ignoring her demands, Cillian pressed on, driving them further from the chaos that engulfed Rosella. Acosta's frustration reached a breaking point, and she resorted to tapping her handgun against his chest, demanding he stop the bike. Pull this bike over. Now, she commanded, her voice sharp with urgency. With a resigned shake of his head, Cillian relented, easing off the throttle and steering them off-road into the fields. He pointed towards a cluster of trees in the distance. When we get to cover, I'll stop, he promised, his voice steady despite the tumultuous situation. Acosta relented, retracting her handgun and stowing it away as they continued towards their makeshift sanctuary. Chapter 6 Cillian guided them to a spot about half a mile outside of town. As the bike slowed to a halt, Acosta leaped off, her restless energy compelling her to pace. Meanwhile, Cillian dismounted with more force, the frustration evident in the way he let the bike crash to the ground, his hands thrown up in exasperation. We have to figure out what we're going to do, Private Acosta asserted, her tone weighted with urgency. Cillian's controlled voice carried a hint of upset as he addressed her. The first thing we're going to do is have a talk about you putting the gun in my chest. Because that's pretty fucked up given everything we've been through together. Acosta's initial instinct was to retaliate, to raise her voice in defense. But the gravity of the situation soon settled upon her. She nodded in acknowledgement of Cillian's point, swallowing her pride as she admitted, You're right, Cillian. I'm sorry. I really am. I just, I didn't know how else to get you to pull over. Emotion began to crack Acosta's voice the weight of their circumstances threatening to overwhelm her. Cillian approached her with concern, placing a comforting hand on her shoulder before gently rubbing her back, urging her to regain her composure. It's okay, Acosta. I get it, Cillian reassured her. I'm so sorry, Cillian. That will never happen again, Acosta promised, her voice strained with remorse. I believe you, and it's okay. I know everything is, well, you know, Cillian responded. As Acosta composed herself, Cillian shifted the conversation, his expression somber as he divulged. I saw Sergeant Alvarez back in town. Acosta's hope flickered briefly before she discerned a pain in Cillian's eyes, nodding in silent acknowledgement of his unspoken words. I just hope he didn't suffer. If he hadn't sacrificed himself, I wouldn't be here right now, Acosta admitted, her gratitude tinged with sorrow. He seemed to go peacefully. At least that's what his killer implied, Cillian revealed his voice tinged with bitterness. Acosta's curiosity was piqued. You talked to the man who shot him? She inquired. Cillian nodded grimly. Yeah, and he seemed just like me, a civilian who got in over their heads. How did you get away? Acosta pressed. He let me leave. Even warned me about his friends to the north of town. I got the sense he didn't want to be there any more than I did. 
Cillian recounted. It might explain what I saw while being chased by those assholes, Acosta reflected. What did you see? Cillian inquired. I ran through a house that I thought was vacant, nearly shot a grandmother and her grandkids who were hiding in the kitchen, Acosta confessed. That doesn't exactly scream militia stronghold. Now does it? Cillian remarked. No, it doesn't. But still, it doesn't change what we have to do. We have to get that truck back, Acosta asserted with determination. I don't know if that's possible, Acosta, Cillian cautioned. Well, we're damn sure going to try. I don't care if they're militia, civilians, or whatever. They have what we swore to deliver to Spokane. And by God, we're going to deliver it, Acosta declared adamantly. I know you want to deliver it, Acosta. I do too. But Cillian trailed off, uncertainty lingering in the air. Acosta's voice surged with emotion as she raised it, her finger pointing forcefully at Cillian as she spoke. Alvarez, Fisher, Henderson, Wallace, Robertson, Bradley, Leonard, Hubbard, all of them are gone. They're never coming back. They laid down their lives for that shipment because they believed in what we're doing. We can't let them die in vain. I can't let them die in vain. Her words trailed off as she struggled to regain her composure, the weight of their sacrifice heavy upon her shoulders. Cillian nodded in solemn agreement, understanding the depth of her conviction. I know, Acosta. I know, I don't want them to die in vain either. But throwing our lives away isn't the way to honor them. They wouldn't want us to do that, Cillian reasoned, his voice steady and firm. As Acosta began to calm, Cillian continued, laying out a plan born of necessity. If the shipment is lost, we need to let your people in Spokane and Seattle know. They need to know what got in the hands of the enemy and what we prevented from reaching their grips. They also need to know what they're up against. These people are heavily armed, highly trained, and relentless. If they get into a heads-up fight with them, thinking they're going to walk right over them, it's going to be a slaughter. Acosta nodded in agreement before her resolve faltered, uncertainty flickering in her eyes. Okay, you go on to Spokane. Report what happened. I'm going to go after the shipment. Cillian shook his head vehemently, stepping between her and the town. No, you're not killing yourself. Get out of my way, Cillian. Acosta demanded, her frustration mounting. Undeterred, Cillian stood his ground, blocking her path. Finally, he proposed a compromise, hoping to sway her with reason. You can't just walk into town. You need to know what the situation is. Then help me. Acosta pleaded, her desperation evident. Cillian deliberated for a moment, knowing the weight of his decision. Okay, we ride back towards town staying far enough away that they don't consider us a threat. Get the bike, Acosta instructed. However, Cillian interjected, halting her in her tracks as he laid out the conditions. If they have an overwhelming force or the ammunition is gone, we go to Spokane together. Acosta pondered his proposal, willing to concede anything to secure his support. With a nod, she agreed. Okay, you have a deal. The two of them mounted the bike, Cillian starting it up as they rode further away from town, putting distance between themselves and the impending confrontation. Over the rugged terrain, they eventually reached a vantage point where they could spot the truck. Cillian retrieved the binoculars, scanning the scene before passing them to Acosta. Here you go, but I don't think you're going to like what you see, he warned, his tone grave. In the heart of the road, the transport truck sat, encircled by three pickup trucks, each manned by a group of armed men. A flurry of activity ensued as several of them hustled to transfer boxes of ammunition. Acosta's eyes then scanned upward, drawn to the rooftops where half a dozen armed figures perched, their vigilant gaze sweeping across the surroundings in every direction. Well, clearly a frontal assault is out of the question, she declared with resignation. Cillian concurred. Any assault is out of the question. When they hit the road in those trucks, they're going to be vulnerable, Acosta reasoned searching for any glimmer of hope. Maybe if we had trucks and a strike team. But you hanging off the back of my dirt bike isn't exactly a strike team, Cillian replied. You're a hell of a rider. You'll make sure we're safe, Acosta insisted. Cillian shook his head slowly, silently pleading for Acosta to understand the futility of their situation. Acosta, it's not going to happen. They have three trucks that will be riding out in a convoy. And based on the show of force there, I think it's safe to assume they're going to have escorts for their convoy as well. We can do it. I know we can, Acosta declared, her voice resolute, though tinged with desperation. 
Acosta, Cillian interjected softly. We have to, Acosta insisted forcefully. It's nothing but flat land for miles. Their shooters would spot us from literally a mile away. And even if by some miracle they don't gun us down, all it would take is one small bump from a truck, and we're wiped out. Acosta paced for a moment, grappling with the truth of Cillian's words. I'm sorry, Acosta. I really am. You know, if there was even a small chance at success, I'd be all for it. But putting a gun to our heads and pulling the trigger would be a preferable alternative than trying to hijack one of those trucks. Cillian admitted solemnly. Acosta's head drooped, her defeat palpable as she muttered, Two trucks. Two trucks. Cillian echoed, puzzled by her sudden change in perspective. I mean, there are two of us, Acosta clarified. Cillian sighed, wrapping an arm around her in a gesture of comfort. If nothing else, you're ambitious. A half-hearted laugh escaped Acosta, mingling with the tears that threatened to spill. I just feel like I'm letting everybody down. You're not, Cillian assured her, his tone gentle yet firm. I know I didn't know them as long as you did, but all of them would be happy to know that you're alive. Although I got the sense that Fisher would be offended if you didn't have a drink in his honor, Cillian remarked, attempting to lighten the mood. When we get to safety, we're splitting a bottle of something strong, Acosta vowed. That's one good thing about the apocalypse. Nobody's going to card me, Cillian quipped, eliciting another smile from Acosta, albeit a bittersweet one. Come on, let's get on the road. We still have some miles to travel before we hit Spokane. Cillian suggested, Acosta nodded solemnly as she settled onto the back of the bike, the engine's hum filling the air as Cillian guided them over the rugged terrain. Her gaze drifted towards the truck, where the militia celebrated their victory. It was a painful sight to witness, but she remained resolute, whispering to herself amidst the rumble of the bike. I'm sorry, Sarge. I really am. I tried. For miles, they rode in silence putting distance between themselves and the town before veering back towards the highway. The journey to Spokane was surprisingly peaceful, the chilly air tempered by the warmth of the sun against their skin. They savored the tranquility, grateful for the absence of pursuers and gunfire, relieved that their harrowing ordeal was finally over. As they approached the outer edge of Spokane, signs of conflict became evident. Burned-out cars littered the roadside, some forming makeshift barricades in the middle of the road. The ground was strewn with zombie corpses, their heads blown out. Cillian navigated the bike skillfully, maneuvering around the obstacles until a loud voice pierced the air through a bullhorn. You need to turn around right now or we'll open fire. Cillian halted the bike, allowing Acosta to dismount as she shouted back, her voice firm with authority. My name is Private Acosta, and you and I both know your threat is bullshit because we are part of the group that was bringing up ammunition for you. The soldiers at the line exchanged glances before one of them signaled for Acosta and Cillian to approach cautiously, hands raised and away from their weapons. As they neared the barricade, a soldier cleared a path for them to pass through. We've been expecting you. When is the shipment getting here? The soldier inquired. You should probably take us to your commanding officer, or whoever the highest ranking person you can find, Acosta suggested. The soldier nodded, gesturing for them to follow through the line. He motioned towards a table stocked with bottled water and snacks. I'll take care of it. In the meantime, please help yourself. It looks like you've been through the ringer, he remarked with sympathy. If you could dig up a medic and maybe a fresh pair of pants, that would be great, Cillian requested, indicating his road rash leg. The soldier winced in empathy before complying with a nod. As they cracked open the water bottles, Relief washed over them, sharing a glance that spoke volumes of their gratitude for finally being safe. Chapter 7 Cillian winced as the doctor's skilled hands applied a soothing antibiotic spray to his road rash leg. The sting of the medication brought a grimace to his face. That's one hell of a scrape there. How did you manage to pull that off? The doctor's inquiry held a hint of both admiration and disbelief. Cillian's response was laced with pride his tone bordering on the edge of boastfulness. I slid my dirt bike underneath a transport truck going 50, while a bunch of bad guys shot automatic weapons at me. Acosta, being tended to on the other side of the small room, couldn't help but chuckle at Cillian's bold recounting of his escapade. Catching her eye, Cillian adjusted his demeanor, toning down his bravado as he turned back to the doctor. 
While I'm sure you had your reasons, you should be aware that we don't exactly have a huge stockpile of medical goods. So in the future, it might be wise to avoid sliding into second, the doctor advised with a touch of sternness. Of course, doctor. I'll keep that in mind, Cillian replied. The doctor continued, explaining the expected healing process. Now, this is going to scab up like crazy over the next few weeks. If you don't pick at it, then you should be okay. I'm not sure where you're off to, but if you can have a professional look at it in two weeks, that would be good. Thanks, Doc. Cillian acknowledged with a nod of gratitude. As the doctor rose and issued instructions to one of his nurses, Private Acosta expressed her appreciation. Thank you for everything, doctor, she said earnestly. The doctor nodded in acknowledgement as he exited the room, leaving Acosta to approach Cillian once her own treatment was completed. You know, normally if a guy told me he pulled off a move like that, I'd just roll my eyes and ignore him for the rest of the night. Then again, I saw it with my own eyes. You brag all you want on that, because that was a badass move Acosta commended. Thank you, Acosta, Cillian replied sincerely. Cillian winced again as the nurse wrapped tight bandages around his leg, the sensation uncomfortable but necessary for his recovery. Once she finished, she assured him, there you go, good as new. Oh, and one of the soldiers brought you both a change of clothes. I put them on the table behind the screen there. Cillian and Acosta inspected the garments, noting the high-end designer labels with surprise. Damn, they really spared no expense for us, huh? Cillian remarked. Acosta couldn't help but find a silver lining in the dire situation. One of the few positives of most of humanity being wiped out. All the high-end clothes we could possibly want. As they dressed on opposite sides of the screen, they continued their banter, finding humor in the situation. I wonder if they'd let me pick out a watch. Always wanted something on my wrist that was worth more than my first car. Cillian mused aloud. I don't see why not. Might even be able to get you some of those thick gold chains like rappers wear, Acosta suggested with a chuckle. I don't think they've really done that since the 1980s, Cillian replied, equally amused. Nothing wrong with going retro, Acosta quipped. Their laughter was interrupted by a voice from the front of the room. Or, you know, we could get you a set of those diamond-studded dentures. If you want to go all out, Captain Page interjected with a smirk, joining in on the light-hearted banter. Acosta and Cillian cautiously peered around the corner, spying a middle-aged blonde woman standing in the doorway. Acosta's eyes widened in recognition as she realized the woman was a captain. Oh my god, Captain. I'm so sorry. Acosta blurted out, her voice laced with embarrassment. Relax, private. Take your time and get dressed, Captain Page reassured, her tone calm and understanding. I'm Captain Page, in charge of logistics here in Spokane. We were just relieving some tension, that's all, Acosta explained hastily, still feeling sheepish. You don't have to explain it to me, Private. I've been in your shoes before. Captain Page responded empathetically. You do whatever you have to do to wind down, and to deal with the loss... As Acosta peeked out again from behind the cover, she watched as Captain Page set a bottle of whiskey onto a nearby table. Whatever you need to do, you'll have the time to do it after our debrief, Captain Page added. Cillian popped his head around the curtain, his youthful eagerness evident as he addressed the captain. You didn't happen to hear me about the watch, did you? Captain Page chuckled at Cillian's enthusiasm, shaking her head. No shopping until after the debrief and probably a chat with a counselor or two. I lost my entire family and several friends before embarking on this trip. You're probably going to need more than two of those counselors, he confessed before Acosta nudged him in admonishment. I mean, thank you, Cillian quickly added, attempting to recover. I'm in the office at the end of the hall. Get yourselves together and come see me, Captain Page instructed. Yes, ma'am, Acosta responded respectfully. As the door began to close behind Captain Page, Acosta nudged Cillian again. Oh, sorry. Yes, ma'am. Cillian corrected himself sheepishly. That's more like it. Now, don't be too long. I have some food being brought in. Captain Page called out through the closing door. Thank you, ma'am. They both chorused in response. Once alone, they finished dressing in their new attire. Cillian asking Acosta, What do you think? How do I look? Like your daddy has a lot of money. Acosta quipped. I'll take it, Cillian replied with a grin. Acosta picked up the bottle of whiskey, a gleam of satisfaction in her eyes. This has our name on it. 
Cillian nodded in agreement as they exited the makeshift doctor's office and entered a bustling office building. Soldiers and civilians bustled about, engrossed in their tasks. It's almost like the apocalypse never happened, Cillian remarked. If only that were the case. Come on, Acosta replied. They navigated through the crowded hallway, making their way to Captain Page's office door. With a tentative knock, they awaited permission to enter. Come on in, Captain Page's voice beckoned from within. They entered Captain Page's office and settled into the seats offered, their eyes drawn to the steaming bowls of soup and freshly baked bread that adorned the desk, accompanied by cold sodas. I'm sorry that it's not more substantial, Captain Page apologized. This is fantastic, Cillian exclaimed. It really is. Thank you, Captain, Acosta added. Captain Page nodded in acknowledgement as she helped herself to a piece of bread, nibbling on it thoughtfully as she spoke. Okay, now that we have your needs tended to, can you tell me what the hell happened out there? You were supposed to have a million rounds of ammunition coming our way, Captain Page inquired, her tone a mix of curiosity and concern. In a nutshell, the militia happened, Cillian summarized. We were barely 20 miles away from the factory when they started attacking us, Acosta elaborated. If they attacked you that early, why didn't you return to the factory? Get more men and firepower before continuing on, Captain Page questioned. Because we thought that was their best shot, Cillian explained, his tone serious. If they were going to hit us, they would hit us the hardest right out of the gate. Go for a kill shot. But we managed to fight them off and get through. Of course, even if we wanted to retreat, we would have had to fight back through the bottleneck we just fought through. So we continued on. Acosta added, her voice carrying a hint of weariness. Captain Page detected the underlying tension in Acosta's words and reassured her. I probably would have done the same thing in your situation. In private? Yes, ma'am, Acosta replied. I'm not here to second-guess you. When you're in the field and it's your ass on the line, when people are shooting at you, nobody has the right to Monday morning quarterback you. I'm sure as hell not going to. And if somebody tries, I want you to report them to me. Captain Page asserted firmly. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Acosta responded gratefully. Now just relax and carry on. I don't need a play-by-play, -play, but I need to get a sense of their manpower and capability. Captain Page instructed, her gaze shifting to Cillian. They're well-trained, that's for sure. And well-organized, they had traps set for us all along the route, slowing us down and forcing us to use up our resources, Cillian reported. What resources? Captain Page inquired. We had plastic explosives as a last resort. If the package was in danger of falling into their hands, we were to rig it to blow, Acosta revealed. Better nobody has it than the enemy, Captain Page remarked, nodding in agreement. The problem was, they had their own explosives. They took a bridge out while we were on it, Acosta continued. They were able to take down a bridge. Captain Page's concern was evident. In a controlled manner, too. They waited until we were on it and set off the charges. Dropped one of our trucks into the shallow water below. Nearly got us all, but that bridge held on just long enough, Acosta recounted. It's not just plastic explosives either. They nearly took me out with an RPG, Cillian added. Acosta and Page exchanged incredulous looks, disbelief evident in their expressions. They shot an RPG at you, Acosta exclaimed, her voice tinged with shock. Yep, at that last diversion we had set up. Ripped a flaming hole in that building. Cillian confirmed. So we have a highly motivated, highly trained group that has a million rounds of additional ammunition. And they're not happy with us, Captain Page summarized. Only two-thirds of a million. I saw one truck detonate, Cillian corrected. So the rigging worked. Acosta inquired, a glimmer of hope in her voice. Like a charm, Cillian confirmed. Thank God for small miracles. But that still puts us at a severe disadvantage. I knew that this area was rife with militia activity, but I had no idea they had that many trained men, Captain Page remarked, her concern deepening. There's more, Captain, Acosta interjected. Of course there is, Captain Page responded. The last truck we lost was 40 miles or so to the south of here in a town called Rosilla, Acosta continued. I'm familiar with it. Well, I've seen the name on the map, but go on, Captain Page prompted. The people I encountered there weren't former military. They were just average people who were loyal to the militia, Acosta revealed. They were loyal to the militia. 
Why? Captain Page questioned, her brow furrowing in confusion. Because they felt abandoned by you people. You ran to Kansas, and the militia stepped in to protect them. If you want some unsolicited teenager advice, you might want to send a welcome committee down to Rosilla, see if you can win them over to your side, Cillian suggested. Or at the very least, get them back to neutral. Put a barrier between you and the militia, Acosta added. Page nodded in agreement. I'll get that set up right away. Thank you for your insights on everything. So now what? I mean, after this experience, I'm not exactly keen on enlisting, Cillian admitted. And I could certainly use a few days off, if you could spare the manpower. Acosta added, I have a train set to leave for Seattle at sundown. Originally, it was there to carry the ammunition back, but it will get you there in one piece. Both of you, Captain Page offered. Thank you, Captain. Cillian expressed his gratitude sincerely. Someone will meet you at the station to get you set up in town. There's a wait list to get proper accommodations. But given what you just did for us, I've taken the liberty of moving you up the list, Captain Page added. Cillian nodded in acknowledgement. If you want to talk to my assistant just outside the door, he'll get you set up with anything you need, including that watch, Page mentioned, a small smile tugging at her lips as she addressed Cillian. But if you'll excuse me, I need to report the situation to command back in Seattle. Thank you both again for what you've sacrificed for us, Captain Page concluded. I'm just sorry that we weren't successful. Acosta expressed her regret, her voice heavy with disappointment. It was an impossible situation, Private. You did what you could. Be well, Captain Page reassured. With a nod of farewell, they exited the office, their attention drawn to the assistant who held up a single finger, indicating they wait a moment. Well, we have a few hours before the train leaves. What do you want to do? Cillian inquired, attempting to lighten the mood. Acosta stood there for a few moments, the weight of the mission finally releasing off of her shoulders. Emotions flooded through her, and Cillian noticed, offering his support by putting his arm around her. He couldn't imagine what she was going through, losing her entire team and failing at the mission in the process. But he knew that he could be there for her, offering the comfort of a friend in a time of need. Chapter 8 Captain Page strode down the dimly lit corridor, her shoulders weighed down by the burden of failure. The somber atmosphere hung heavy, palpable to her soldiers who dared not meet her gaze. Each solemn nod and lowered head conveyed the unspoken acknowledgement of defeat that loomed over them since their encounters with the militia began. Entering the conference room, Captain Page closed the door behind her with a heavy sigh, shutting out the world as she prepared to confront the harsh reality of their mission. At the far end of the room, a ham radio crackled with voices from the other side, taking her seat with a weary grace. She collected herself, the weight of her responsibilities settling upon her like a heavy cloak. My apologies for the delay, gentlemen. Captain Page addressed her comrades, her voice tinged with weariness. I've just concluded the debrief with the delivery team. It's no problem, Captain, Clint replied. And Corporal Gad, are you there as well? Captain Page inquired. Yes, Captain. I'm here, Corporal Gad responded. We're eager to hear your report. With a heavy heart, Captain Page delivered the grim news. I'm afraid you won't like what I have to say. The situation is catastrophic. A heavy silence fell over the line, the gravity of her words sinking in. Undeterred, Captain Page pressed on. Three trucks, each laden with roughly a million rounds of ammunition. One destroyed, the other two seized by the enemy. Jesus Christ! Corporal Gad muttered, his disbelief mirroring the shock reverberating through the radio. And it gets worse. Captain Page continued, her voice steady despite the weight of the revelation. The militia is highly organized, well-trained, and well-armed. They've employed tactics beyond our expectations, including the use of explosives and shoulder-fired rockets. Now they've got half a million rounds in their arsenal, Clint remarked grimly. But there's more, Captain Page added. The militia has managed to sway the populace of Rosilla to their cause. They won over the populace. What does that even mean? Corporal Gad questioned. It means they have civilians who are loyal to them, Captain Page explained. That's not ideal, Clint remarked dryly, the understatement hanging heavy in the air. Determined to salvage what they could from the wreckage of their mission, Captain Page laid out her plan. I'm assembling a welcoming committee to head down there. If they're civilians and not hardcore militia, we might be able to win them over to our side, or at the very least, prevent them from being openly hostile towards us. 
I want you to load up a pickup truck with food and supplies to take to them, Clint suggested. We don't have much to spare, Corporal Gad pointed out. But if they see we're willing to reach out and help them survive, they might come around, Clint countered. Risking one truckload of supplies is worth it if it means avoiding a larger conflict. I'll make it happen, Clint, Captain Page affirmed. Please send some of your best people, Captain, Clint requested. Captain Page's senses prickled with unease at the concerned undertone in Clint's voice. Is there something I should know, Clint? She inquired, her brow furrowing with concern. We're receiving reports of escalating tensions with the militias, Clint revealed, his words laden with apprehension. Skirmishes along the Portland front, threats to Captain Kersey's team in Boise, and a situation brewing in Kansas. Kansas. That's quite a distance for a conflict, especially with fuel becoming scarcer by the day. Captain Page remarked, puzzled by the unexpected development. Clint hesitated before responding, a flicker of reluctance in his voice. I won't delve into the details, but there are deserters causing trouble out there. Naturally, it's something we prefer to keep under wraps. I agree. The last thing we need is rumors spreading among the ranks, Captain Page concurred. Can I count on your discretion, Captain? Corporal Gad interjected. You have my word. Although if I suddenly disappear, you'll know where to find me. Captain Page quipped, attempting to lighten the mood, albeit unsuccessfully. That's not funny, Captain. Corporal Gad chided. I don't know, Gad. I found it amusing. Clint interjected. Relax, Gad. I'm not going anywhere. Captain Page reassured, her tone softening. Although if this peace mission doesn't go well, I might not have a choice in the matter. How are things on your end, Captain? Clint inquired. Could be better. Captain Page admitted, her voice tinged with weariness. We have a thousand troops under my command, along with 300 on chain gang duty clearing out the suburbs. What about supplies? Corporal Gad pressed. We've had some success there, Captain Page replied, her tone brightening slightly. Clearing out the houses has yielded about 10,000 rounds of ammunition, though most of it is for smaller caliber firearms or hunting rifles. It's sufficient for dealing with the creatures, but inadequate against a well-equipped adversary. You would think in a country with tens of billions of bullets that we'd be finding more than a few thousand, Gad added. We have had better luck finding bullets closer to the downtown area, probably because those locations were overrun quickly, so looting didn't have a chance to happen. The further out we get, the less we're finding. People grabbing their stash and getting out of Dodge? Gad replied. I don't think so, Gad. It's a lot more thorough than that. And we're finding that the gun cabinets and homes of people who clearly didn't escape cleared as well. A lot of shelf-stable food was removed as well. Could it be a coordinated effort? Clint speculated. It would make sense. The militias in the area had the better part of a month to do whatever they wanted to up here. I don't know about you two, but if I had the manpower to loot entire neighborhoods during the apocalypse, the first thing I would do is go for food and weapons, Page said. Not only are they well-armed, but it seems they're well-fed too, Corporal Gad noted grimly. That might not be the case if there are thousands of them, Clint countered. Thanks for that, Clint, Corporal Gad retorted sarcastically. It's a reality we must confront, Clint insisted, his tone serious. Clint's right. There was just far too much missing for this to be the work of a handful of people, Captain Page concurred. Captain, how far out have you been sending your teams? We're approaching the outer suburbs to the north, replied Captain Page. Gad's expression tightened. I want you to pull your people back. Confusion flickered across Captain Page's face. Corporal, we have to assume the worst, Gad explained grimly. We have to assume that these groups are massive and are working together. With the recent spike in encounters and the added knowledge that at a minimum they outgun us, I want to minimize the potential for confrontations. Gad is right, Captain. I've seen this before. Two sides going tit for tat over seemingly inconsequential things, then one side pushes too far, and the situation goes nuclear. Clint interjected. I'll order my people back to a defensive line, and don't worry. We're not going to push too far. Clint emphasized, Captain. Make sure your troops understand the gravity of the situation, especially the ones you send to Rosilla. You got it, Clint. Captain Page affirmed. Anything else, Captain? Corporal Gad inquired. Not at the moment, Corporal. We'll be ready to deploy to Rosilla within a few hours, Captain Page replied. If you could hold off for a few days, Captain, Clint requested. 
time is of the essence, Clint. Captain Page countered, puzzled by his request. You're right, but I want to make sure that tempers have calmed in Rosilla before your men go there. If the transport team killed or injured a local, Clint said, I understand, Clint. I'll give it a few days, Captain Page assured. I appreciate your cooperation, Captain. If you require any assistance, Clint offered. I'll keep you informed. Stay safe, both of you, Captain Page concluded. As the line went dead, Captain Page remained seated, the weight of the conversation bearing down on her with relentless force. Every worst-case scenario raced through her mind, each one more daunting than the last. A potential war with an enemy of unknown strength, coming from an unknown direction, with the only known factor being they significantly outgun us. She muttered aloud, the gravity of the situation sinking in with each word. Paige sat there in silence, her thoughts a tumultuous whirlwind of uncertainty and dread. Finally, with a heavy sigh, she straightened up in her chair, determined to face the challenges ahead head-on. Summoning her assistant with a sharp whistle, Captain Page waited impatiently until they entered the room. Yes, Captain, the assistant inquired. I need you to gather every bit of information we have on the town of Rosilla. Just to the south of us, Captain Page commanded, her voice steady despite the turmoil within. And I want a full inventory of our food and medical supplies. Yes, ma'am, the assistant replied promptly. And find me something strong to drink. Captain Page added, her tone betraying a hint of weariness. The assistant's expression shifted to one of concern before nodding and hurrying off to fulfill their orders. With a heavy heart, Captain Page rose from her chair and crossed the room to throw open the window. Below, the train yard bustled with activity. Surveying her troops and the civilians assisting them, Captain Page felt a pang of concern for their well-being. Most of them had never faced combat outside of battles against the undead and the prospect of a new human adversary filled her with unease. I'm afraid this is going to get a lot worse before it gets better, she murmured to herself. The end 